right. Hello, everyone. It is uh, 12 o'clock Eastern, so we will get started. Uh, Miigwech, merci beaucoup. Thank you all for joining us for our health sciences webinar today entitled Anishneen Abi Ishkiki Plant Medicines to Support Mental Health. And our webinar today is delivered by Joseph Bedankwit, who is the founder and director of Creators Garden. I'm Dr. Michael Ravenick, the manager of the health sciences programs at NASM. And before we get started, I'm just going to do some quick uh, welcomes and introductions. Uh, here's the agenda for our webinar today. We will try to finish right at uh, one o'clock and we'll have a moderated Q&A for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. But certainly, if you have any questions that come up that you want to make sure that uh, Joseph addresses, uh, please do put them into the chat box. And this is just a quick reminder about uh, your camera and microphone. Uh, please keep those off uh, during the webinar, uh, unless you are uh, speaking or, or have a question and would prefer to uh, uh, put your microphone on to ask it. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube uh, within two to three weeks after the webinar. And all of our previous webinars are now on YouTube, and you can find those links to those recordings on our Rehabilitation Sciences and NOTIP websites in the resources sections. And that includes the previous webinar that uh, uh, Joe did for us back in November uh, when uh, we were specifically talking about plant medicines and pain. So we'll start with the land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that the entirety of NASM's wider campus of Northern Ontario is the ancestral traditional lands of the First Nations people and Métis people who resided alongside. We also respectfully acknowledge that the medical school building at Laurentian University is located in the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory and at Lakehead University in the Robinson Superior Treaty Territory. So today's speaker, as I mentioned, is Joseph Benanquit, and he has done a webinar for us before, but uh, not everyone uh, will have attended that. So I'll still quickly introduce Joe. So Joe is uh, a Jibawe from Wequamkun, where he lives with his wife and daughter. He's, uh, as I mentioned, the founder and director of Creators Garden, uh, an indigenous outdoor and now, and now online education-based business. Uh, that's focused on plant identification, beyond sustainable harvesting, and teaching everyone of their linguistic, historical, cultural, edible, ecological, and medicinal significance through experiences. His lectures and intensive programming have been delivered to a variety of organizations, including over 100 First Nations communities, 20 different universities and 12 colleges, as well as dozens of institutions throughout Canada, the United States, and beyond. He's completing a Master's in Environmental Sciences at York University, but has learned from hundreds of traditional knowledge holders and is uniquely blending and reinforcing it with an array of Western sciences. Miigwech, thank you, merci beaucoup, Joe, for your time today. I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and turn things over to you. All righty. Sweet. So, should be all good. Can hear me okay? Yep, can hear you, Joe. Right on. Whew, I was real thirsty. Got all nervous. Can't, can't find the link. I was like, Mike, help me. <laughs> <laughs> I went on to, to go get the link and then it said canceled. I thought, oh no. So I panicked. Now my mouth's all dry. It's <laughs> good. Half kidding. But we're, so, yeah, we're good to go. Um, Sweet. Okay. So today, um, yeah, I wanted to be able to share some, some, um, some medicine knowledge, uh, plant medicine knowledge that, um, that we use for, yeah, stay mentally healthy and happy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, um, I, when did, probably, uh, well, my daughter was real small. 
so she must it must have been like six over six years ago um we were doing some work with um ices at sunnybrook the institute for clinical evaluative science and uh that guy too his name was mike he he was uh following me around all day i i, I did so i did a presentation with them in the morning and then in the afternoon we went for a walk um with some of their um with some of the leadership in that organization so i went for a walk around their uh their place in toronto and um just brought the that uh medicinal plant context to whatever i could <laughs> it was all invasive species though it was kind of hard <laughs> but uh we were just cruising around and uh just walking it was raining too but still like everybody still came uh and um it was super fun just uh talking about all of the different medicine that was growing right there um just <laughs> just in rural urban setting <laughs> It was pretty cool, but that guy, um, Mike, the, the he's he's like I don't know CEO or whatever you would call him, the the boss over there, and uh, he's real tall, so he's like standing on top of me all day, like he was real close in my bubble all day. So I try to tell Mike you're in my bubble, but he was like he was like on top of me, looking looking at me, and. Uh, he had so much questions, just asking questions, questions, questions. Um, I thought, oh, this is, um, uh, I started just um, uh, listening to all of the questions that he was asking. There was a real clear theme, like all, like probably around 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, I realized that there's a really clear theme to his, to, to the questions that he was asking all had to do with mental health uh and addictions as well so finally i just i stopped <laughs> made sure he was outside of my bubble like hey mike why are you asking all day about mental health stuff and he did so then he brought that uh sort of epidemiological context to to his questions saying you know this is such a huge issue uh the the anxiety and depression and the 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 issues associated with that mis mismanagement of of stress um uh, it's it's such a massive it's one of the, it's the biggest it, like if he had to really um look at everybody and if there was one thing that that would that he could he could consider to be one of the biggest problems that would be it be would be mental health uh and, and addictions too um he had a lot to say about the opiate epidemic in canada um and then in indigenous communities as well so i was like oh wow this is um this is a real issue and he said yeah you know they're investing so much time and energy uh so much money is being invested into this field like we really want to know what it's all what, what's happening here and so he wants to know all the types of medicine and medicine knowledge to so that he has some tools to for you know for this uh for for the problem and um then i remember i left um my wife picked me up because i didn't have my license yet and so she she picked me up and um we were we were driving um and we have a sub old real we had a real old subaru and uh the windows like um they don't have it's not sealed so like it's super loud you might as well drive with the windows down everywhere it's so loud inside then i remember we left and then as we started talking about this about all the questions that he was asking me all about mental health and talking about this crisis they you know they they really taught me a lot about the the realities of the situation and so i was explaining it to my wife and then i remember we didn't even jump on the highway because because then we can't talk <laughs> we can't visit on the highway because the the um, vehicle would be too loud so we took some back roads um and just on our way up to barry on our way home to manitoula uh and and we just took like i don't know, like it's highway seven or whatever anyways um uh uh a slower slower route so that we could keep visiting <clears throat> we did that all the time uh but anyways what we were talking about is um like 
well, cause we're like a business, right? We're teach about medicine all over. And we're like, if this is where they're spending lots of, lots of resources, lots of, lots of money is being sent here. I should be catering to this specifically, maybe, uh, cause, because I was, I mean, I wasn't just doing it for money. Uh, the, the, I would, uh, good follow up to the last session that we did on uh, pain management. All I was doing for like three years was making arthritis salve. Like that's all I did was make this medicine. It was super successful, but I was like basically on tour doing the exact same thing every single day, and I couldn't handle it anymore. I was like, I don't even want to do this. And then this mental health opportunity. I was like, if we make a mental health, um. Uh, talk about all of the medicines that 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 help with mental health um, 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 directly, peripherally. We're gonna like people would want it. Then I'd be able to talk about something else. <laughs> so we did. Spent a couple months, um, consolidated a lot of research, uh, and made a, a formal presentation. Just basically taking all of the medicine that we work with, uh, um, which is like around. 150, 160 different species of plants. And we could separate that into like all of the medicines that support mental health and addictions and then everything else. And we ended up having like almost 60 different species of mental health and addictions medicine. Um, and so we consolidated that in a three day program that uh, um, we, we delivered for the first time six years ago in November. And we did that in Zagomak on the North shore. And, um, <laughs> it was super fun. Realized very quickly that we cannot do this in three days. Uh, now it's a 12 day program <laughs> and we did, we did this in quite a few communities. Um, not last year, the year, the year before. Um, and it's so fun. Um, it's super, um, effective i don't know how else to say uh m m more often than not we're working with uh like with health centers with mental health teams that exist in indigenous communities or exist in a in a hospital um and working with them get, giving them the tools that they need understanding of all of the different medicines that support different aspects of your mental health uh and so over the past six years that so that um really quickly turned into like the only program anybody ever wanted. So it went from only doing arthritis up now. Oh, he does mental health medicines. We need to learn about that. And so like, that's all everybody wanted. And so now, and then especially, uh, given the pandemic, it's like made it, made it even more. So like, this is such an incredibly important thing. All everybody ever wants is this is mental health. So, so what I did for us today is sort of, uh, um, um, and what I do for these really time restricted presentations, um, is sort of look at 2 main things in, in the last 6 years of delivering this presentation. 1 of the things that we are obsessed with is, um, um, uh, um, learning from our experiences when we go into a community and we teach them about the, the mental health, the known mental health medicines, and uh, then they, they do it. And, um, uh, and so in the, in the beginning, I was using just some of our personal experience with my family, community members, um, like that I've given this medicine to, and it, and it had a really profound effect. So I share with them this, these stories, like, and of half a dozen people. So like, you know, I've, I've seen the, this for like anxiety and depression. Some of these medicines work really well to help with sleep, to help with all of these different things. Um, and so I started sharing it like Zagamak, the first one, you know, there was maybe like 20 uh, um, different um, uh, um, participants there of their leadership that we worked with, but they took it to their families um, and my follow-up with them um, they were able to tell, they tell me what happens like, Hey, 
I used that. I, I you remember you did that mental health medicine. I used that. I this is what I used, and this is what happened. And so I gave it to this person, and this person, and this person, and this is what happened, and this is what happened. And so that experience, that anecdote grows, uh, and over the last six years has grown so much because we'll like we started with three days. We probably did this like we go like bouncing around from community to community every single week like that's all we did was travel um um we'd only come home to to clean our clothes and pack again <laughs> and feed my cat and then we'd leave uh my poor cat she really likes uh the pandemic but anyways i i um all we did for years was was working with people with all these different mental health medicines uh and and like that anecdote grew from just being a couple dozen people in my community to to thousands across the province um um and into the states uh and so um that's what i wanted to share today is just sort of like looking at two of the most effective medicines for that we use for um uh, mental health uh, and mainly today, you know, uh, just taking two of probably the biggest issues when it comes to uh, mental health, the kingpins of uh, uh, mental illness. And so we look at anxiety and depression. Uh, and so the two medicines that I got for, for everybody today is, uh, I hope I got it. Oh, no, I don't got it here. I got to grab it again. It's not this one. I gotta add this one. Okay, there we go. So I wanna talk about two different things, mainly. We're gonna look at, um, uh, oh, and then, and then maybe, yeah, yeah, anyway, so we'll talk about two main things. We'll talk about inflammation and inflammation's role uh, in mental illness, anxiety and depression. And then we'll talk about, uh, we'll start with this one. We'll start with the medicine that's very um dedicated to um your mental health um so if i can go like this and like this so you could see me um yeah so these two are the of all of the experiences that we've worked we've we've had so far um uh, is these these two are the most effective, <laughs> by far the most effective uh, medicines for anxiety and depression. Uh, so the first one is um, it's called um, Wika. Wika. I'll write that in the chat for you guys. It's called um, Sweet Flag. is is the common name. The Latin name is uh, Chorus Calamus. The variation is Americanus. Um, and we use these leaves and we make tea. So this was taught to me like super simple. It was actually really hilarious. Um, <laughs> I was uh, in my community, Vikram Kong, and, um, I was at the Andes, the grocery store. That's also the gas station. That's a convenience store. That's also a hardware store. It's like the one store in the, in the community, <laughs> laundry mat, everything. And I was doing groceries. And then I just passed by, uh, she was the chief at the time, Hazel Fox, uh, and I just passed her in the hall and, or in the aisle. And she's like, Hey, you know, the leaves from Wika, we used Ronnie told me we use that for depression. Then she just kept walking and I was like, Oh, <laughs> the heck. Um, okay. <laughs> then I just kept going. I, I was like, Oh. You know, Ronnie Wakagizek, he was like one of our main uh, last uh, um, medicine people in the community. And uh, yeah, so he had told Hazel that this is the medicine that he uses for depression. And so I asked my grandma um, what she has to teach me about Wika. And one of the things about this plant, Wika, is that um, it's uh, really, really common to for people to harvest. It's, you know, like you, you go on the in indigenous communities and there's like lots of cedar tea. There's lots of uh, Labrador tea or like whatever, just these medicine teas. Um, Wika, 
um, we use these roots when we get sick. If we have a cold or something, you chew on these roots like a halls, like a lozenge, and it provides some of the most incredible relief from a cold, uh, sore throat. Uh, and like you could just you could continue to work all day. You could continue to teach or or uh, sing. Singers will use it like at powwows or something like that. So it's really really common, but less so to understand how to use the leaves. And so when I asked my grandma. Uh, about this. So what about the leaves? Uh, Hazel just told me we used to use it for depression. Ronnie used to use it that way. Oh, yes, she says. <laughs> uh, that's um, that's important. It, and it, it, it would work for that. Um, and so she uh, so she left it at that. And then when I got some, I found some, harvested it, dried it out and made made some tea. Uh, I started taking this to people in my community who had like anxiety, depression, these these sorts of issues. Uh, and and in the case of anxiety, there they they would have uh, that I'd meet them later in the community, and they'd tell me that you know they started sleeping really well. Um, they started having really good sleeps. They started to they were able to take really deep breaths, uh, and they're able to their heart rate slows down after a stressful situation. Their heart rate calms down, and they're they're able to um, they have more control. And and one of the feedbacks is they always seem to have uh, uh, more control over their breath. Um, and so I was taking in all of these stories, you know, and and. Um, uh, one of the ways that we control how this how this presentation uh, how this uh, um, program is conducted is um, understanding that there's like there's like sixty different things that um, um, that we can use specifically for mental health. Um, this is only one, but one of the reasons why I wanted to share it with you today is because it's the best one. Not because it has the most powerful mechanism of action, but because it's the best tasting. <laughs> it tastes just like lemongrass. It smells and tastes so good, um, like even better than lemongrass. Uh, it's beautiful, and and so so you, it's actually drinkable because there's other medicine there too. Like um, ziganish is a flower that you could use, and it has a really tremendous like calming action. Um, really amazing for uh um people with anxiety and depression like it, it's it's very very effective uh blue harebell but it tastes like your mouth you can't even swallow it it's so bitter it's so nasty your as soon as it touches your mouth your mouth wants to immediately eject it out like violently it, it's really and i'm not even exaggerating like i love my tea super strong but I can't, uh, not a lot of us can be able to handle that. So it's there, it works, it's amazing, uh, but it's not, it's not even culturally relevant or appropriate because it, uh, no one's going to drink it. Uh, and then there's like other ones that we use for, uh, that, like that really help. Um, we use them now mainly for like neurodegenerative disorder, uh, like, like MS. Uh, um, and those roots, like they smell and they taste like if you can imagine that smells just like cat pee and it tastes as like exactly the way cat pee would if you if you if you were to drink it like it's so bad and for that reason alone like you, you could go through over all the amazing things the mechanisms that this plant has probably not even gonna drink it because it's gonna taste so bad so we can um we can it tastes so good and this is probably why it, on top of having a really amazing mechanism of action it's probably why it's it it's so uh to be one of my one of the most effective mental health medicines that we have is just because you're gonna drink this just because you want to just because you enjoy it just because it's the best tasting thing ever that's why and so the um so i just want to spend some time with you to be able to explain um how it works just because it's actually pretty pretty simple um i don't want to get too complex or lost in the weeds because I still have another one that I wanted to share. Um, but 
it's really amazing. Uh, um, like, you know how in your body, everything is opposites that, that fight, that fight each other. And that's how your body works. Like every hormone, um, your muscles, even like your, tri your bicep and your tricep are opposite, two opposite forces that fight against each other. So your arms can move and like your, your legs, your quads and your hammies. So your legs can move all your fingers. Everything is just opposites that fight each other. And then that's your body working properly. <laughs> it's real fun to think about it that way. Uh, it, I really thought, thought about that when, when I got, was watching a birch bark canoe getting built, because that boat does nothing about it makes sense. The way the gunnels want to uh, fling out, the way the ribs want to go, the way the bark is curling, everything is fighting each other. And then, uh, but it's a boat. It's weird. <laughs> Anyways, in your body, the same thing. Uh, so one of the ones uh, is uh, uh, obviously like your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. Um, stressed out survival mode and relax and uh, and take deep breaths, lower your heart rate and digest your food. Um, and so you pendulate between these two throughout the day. Uh, you receive a stressful situation. You, you meet a speed trap on the highway <laughs> or you see a moose on the highway uh or you read an email you don't like <laughs> and then uh so you go sympathetic you get stressed out then your parasympathetic turns on calms you down relaxes you uh, uh maybe have an insulin response bring those blood sugars down chillax um uh what happens though is i think maybe this has more to do with inflammation and hyperinsulinemia than anything but um so many different factors, maybe even genetic factors, make it so that it's very hard. Your parasympathetic action weakens. Uh, and when your parasympathetic action is weak, um, you, it's not able to relax you all the way that it can to its fullest potential. And so rather than chilling all the way out, calming your heart rate to the way that it should be, um, sleeping as hard as you should, you're, you're, you're going to be constantly or, or a little bit, a little bit sympathetic uh it's not able to pull you back if parasympathetic is not able to pull you back all the way so you stay slightly elevated slightly sympathetic slightly in survival mode slightly stressed out all the time and the longer you stay there that'll that'll establish itself as chemistry and become your new normal and then another trauma happens parasympathetic action still impaired not able to bring you back all the way that'll establish itself as chemistry and then another trauma and another trauma and you spend uh uh years of your life creating Creating, establishing this ladder of chemistry to the point where you're just rocking survival mode all the time. So there's there's almost no parasympathetic action. And that's where you get diagnosed anxiety, depression, PTSD. Uh, PTSD is 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 uh, even measurable in the form of of, of a tissue of, of of those those traumas representing themselves as a as a tissue inside of your neck, like the the stellate ganglion. Um, which has uh, been famous since the 20s, the stellate ganglion block procedure for war veterans to get that uh, sedative injected into that neural network, uh, that physical representation of all of those traumas and all of that chemistry uh, um, represented now in the tissue. And when you inject a sedative into it, um, a veteran will go from um, contemplation to to singing in the shower the next day. It's, it, it was a very famous procedure. Um, and so uh, now it's not so often done. It's, it's very expensive to do. It's not very profitable. Um, and so actually what I wanted to share today is when when this the, the stellate ganglion block stellate ganglion block procedure is so effective um the, it has been in the drug discovery spotlight since like the 30s the from industry has been trying to figure out a drug uh that can mimic the action that can sedate the stellar ganglion um to to allow parasympathetic action because that's what it does is prevent parasympathetic action it's a physical tissue that blocks parasympathetic action. So you can't calm down, you can't lower your heart rate, you can't relax, you can't sleep, always on, always aware, hypervigilant, um, 
it really, it's a survival mechanism. It's a survival tactic uh, because like you take somebody who's in war, you never know when somebody's going to bust in your camp with machine guns and grenades everywhere. So you always have to be on, always have to be aware. Uh, you're always thinking of all of your contingencies and, uh, and so anxiety and, and ruminating on your contingencies, ruminating on past traumas, so depression. Uh, and so the this procedure um is very effective and so yeah it's been in the drug discovery spotlight for for so long to try to create a drug that mimics the same action as the as the as the procedure uh and when you look at all of the candidates for uh in in this specific field of drug discovery uh look at all of the candidates the first place that a pharmaceutical company or industry will look uh scientists will look to, is at plants to, to find uh, uh, an indigenous use of plants to be able to find the medicine uh, and then maybe extrapolate a mechanism of action that they could create a synthetic that have, does in the same thing as the plant. Uh, and that's how that's the process that how we get most of the drugs that we use today. And it's been it's been done for like almost 100 years now on uh on on this specific action if there could be a drug that does this wouldn't this be amazing uh to be able to basically uh sedate the sedate ptsd sedate the traumas uh like that procedure does anyways out of every plant in the planet that has been analyzed uh as a as a as a candidate for that still a ganglion block drug um it's been um it's been a, a combination of components inside of Wika. This has been in the spotlight for like almost 60 years as being one of the most uh, effective to not sedate the, that neural network, but to create a bypass, uh, to make it easy for the individual to establish a bypass mechanism around it. So to enable parasympathetic action. So just to simplify this, my wife uh, like watched a, TED talk or something. So a psychologist, uh, and she explained it to me very well, where you think of your brain as like a, as a ski hill that has fresh powder. And when you start going down this hill, uh, you make a bunch of trails and those trails become easy to follow, uh, and, and will eventually come paths. Um, that, and, and so that's kind of like the way your brain works, like to follow all the same patterns and, uh, and, and, um, I believe she was talking about rumination and PTSD as being just falling down these same negative thought patterns. Um, and the way to understand what we can does and, and, and what, what, uh, um, what, what a lot of other things do too. Like, I think, I believe the speaker was talking about like CBT to be able to, um, uh, put some fresh powder on the hill. Now you can make. You can make new paths uh, and the combination of this medicine, um, uh, the combination of this medicine um, and therapy, uh, wh whether that's conventional therapy or like the cultural council uh, or like, you know, tradition uh, and like the, the historical council that's responsible for um, for people to maintain that proper pendulation between sympathetic and parasympathetic, giving you the tools you need to be able to create new, healthy, uh, happy uh, paths and thought patterns. And so this medicine helps you by um, establishing, by making it easier to establish bypass uh, mechanisms, but um, it's that culture and or that therapy that's going to keep you there, uh, to keep you pendulating properly, to give you the tools you need to, so that you don't just create that ladder again uh, and, and, and uh, um, uh, that ladder of, of chemistry and all of those traumatic situations to give you what you need to be able to deal with it. So it's important to understand that this is like a, this is a one, two sort of thing. It's not just this plant does this and, and, and you're good to go. Um, uh, it, it's a combination of this medicine and culture. Uh, that being said, um, and, and yeah, I could completely consider therapy um, should be a, a common part of our sort of conventional culture. It's a, it's a very important. Anyways, 
um, I wanted to be able to explain this one that, you know, out of all of the medicine that I could share, this one has a really specific action towards uh, your, your directly on and with your nervous system uh, and, and does really amazing things there. Um, but in the years that we've spent delivering this program, it's never, it's not been the, the, the most effective overall. Um, what everybody says overall is um, because a lot of people don't have access to it because sometimes this plant can be a little, a little hard to find. And, and so when people don't have access to it, like, I want to make sure that, that I have, that there are options, things that it, like just about anybody can find anywhere in Ontario, anytime. Uh, and so I always make sure to teach about um, this one. Um, these leaves here is from a plant uh, called Gabag Mish. Gabag Mish. Gabag Mish is sweet fern, which is Comptonia peregrina. And this grows anywhere where there's blueberries, right into the Arctic Circle, down into California, all over the state. It's a, it's a very, very common plant, and most people can uh, can can find it. Um, and what this medicine does, this is where we sort of teach about inflammation's role in in mental health um, and how. Uh, um yeah the 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 associative or now in literature the causative role that inflammation plays in anxiety and depression is huge if we could control inflammation we could control the disease the 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 mental illness um and so understanding that a lot of the mental disease that we face the mental illness that we face, the anxiety and depression that we have is driven by inflammation. If we could identify where this inflammation is coming from, we would be able to control the, the disease. And so the source of uh, um, the, the primary source of inflammation in your body is from your intestines, um, uh, is, is, um, uh, if if your intestines is where a, a lot of the inflammation and systemic inflammation is coming from, this needs to be dealt with. This needs to be plugged up. Uh, and, and if we could remove the primary source of inflammation, maybe the individual will be able to handle uh, to be able to control total inflammatory scores and then the mental illness. So that was the way that I taught about it anyway. When people can't access any of the other medicines for mental health. Almost everybody in all of the communities that we go to knows sweet fern because it grows anywhere where blueberries do. Uh, a lot of people, when they pick blueberries, use sweet fern to put in the basket so that, like a pillow for the blueberries, so they don't get all damaged when you're harvesting them. Uh, so, and like, and so they're always beside each other and, and people who are go pick blueberries will pick this one. And there's a, there's a memory of making tea. Uh, there's lots of, you know, living memory and living practice in communities, indigenous communities using sweet fern as a bath for, especially for babies. Uh, and, uh, and, and even being the baby's first bath. Uh, and so this is very important. A lot of people remember and then have easy access to the plant. So I always make sure to teach about this one. And I started just teaching about it at first, but it really quickly snowballed into people saying, I couldn't find Wika, couldn't find Lady Slippers, I couldn't find the, I couldn't, but there was sweet fern everywhere. So I just started using that one. And this is what happened. <laughs> uh, and it having such an incredible action on, uh, on, on their mental health, on the anxiety and depression that they had. Um, so, like, you know, so probably for lack of a better term, preaching to the choir, but um, just to explain what happens with the with the intestines, why the intestines are your primary source of systemic inflammation is the same reason why, like, when you get a mosquito bite, the mosquito doesn't want to suck up, you know, triple thick blood. It, um it what it so it injects these proteins inside of your inside to thin your blood so it could fill itself up faster and then take off uh and so those little bits of protein your immune system sees them uh and sends a bunch of inflammation there 
because inflammation immobilizes the pathogens, the viruses, bacteria, proteins, fungus, everything. Uh, inflammation immobilizes them. So then your immune system can see, what is it? How do I deal with it? Do I need neutrophils? Do I need macrophages? What do I need? Um, in the case of the protein, it's, it's, probably, it's just a bunch of macrophages go in and eat them all and dispose of them that way. Uh, but um, everybody deals with mosquito bites differently too, right? You, you get a mosquito bite in the morning. Sometimes for some of us, it'll be gone at noon. And it's like, ah, mosquito bites don't even really bother some of us. They, we could get bit up in the morning. It's fine. They'll be gone by lunchtime. <laughs> uh, but then some of us will get mosquito bites at uh, Monday and we'll be at a barbecue on Saturday and we still have them. Um, so we deal with inflammation differently because it takes a long time for our immune system to learn how do I deal with these proteins. If you deal with them really, if you deal with mosquito bites well, it's because you get a lot of bites. If you don't deal with mosquito bites well, generally that's because your immune system doesn't have the time or experience to learn. It needs to be taught. And, and I get wrecked in the spring every year so bad picking leaks or like bark, uh, taking bark off the tree. I get so badly bitten in the spring and I get pretty damaged, but throughout the rest of the summer, because of that, my immune system has lots of experience to learn how to deal with these different types of proteins that I go the rest of the summer being able to get bit lots and it's fine. I don't need, I don't need deed or anything like that. I just know it's going to be gone soon. It'll be over eventually. Um, anyways, same thing with your, with your guts, you know, in your gut, you have your permeable intestinal wall, things can go in, things can go out. And then you have that, the layer of mucin, that's the barrier, right? The, the glutamine mucin barrier that seals your intestine. So now not everything can go in and out. And then you have your, all the bacteria and all of the poo-poo. <laughs> uh, um, and so what happens is in your small intestine, the bacteria eat two things. They eat fiber from the food you're eating or the mucin. Just recently, in the, in, within the past couple of years, we've identified that they could actually eat three things. Uh, they're butyrate-loving bacteria, both in the small and large intestine, uh, that, that, eat, um, that eat ketones. So uh, when we don't have enough fiber in the food that we eat, um, and we're not maintaining uh, ketogenesis to, to a certain degree, then those bacteria have, will eat mucin. They'll eat through that barrier, which is fine. Because glutamine, what makes up the mucin, that, that, that barrier in your intestine is uh, a non-essential amino acid. Uh, your, body, it's in, your body can endogenously make that, that mucin. Um, one of the reasons why uh, we, we identify nine essential amino acids now is because glutamine is a conditionally essential amino acid. There's conditions you could put your body under where it's no longer able to make glutamine. And that condition is called stress. <laughs> Adrenaline and cortisol to in very small amounts inhibits your ability to produce glutamine. So athletes, because of the amount of uh, physical stress they put their body through, don't make glutamine very well. So they know they have to supplement it. Uh, and so um, when you're stressed and you're not making glutamine, the bacteria eat through the glutamine and get out into your into your body because your digestive system is outside of your body. So when they get into your, go from outside of your body in your intestines to inside of your body, <laughs> I got to find a better way to explain that, but they get into your body. Uh, there's an inflammatory response to immobilize the bacteria. Uh, and then there's a learning that has to happen. How do I deal with this bacteria? Your intestines can have a hundred to 200 different strains of bacteria in it at any given time. Uh, obviously this changes with seasons actually it probably doesn't change much because we don't really have seasons anymore we just eat, still eat avocados in the winter but you 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 have you potentially 200 different strains of bacteria coming out into your body your immune system has to learn how to deal with all of them and being able to deal with bacteria is a lot more challenging and complex than dealing with a rogue protein like from a mosquito so the inflammation is is uh the amount of inflammation that's required to be able to immobilize this flood of bacteria coming out into your body is a lot um that will eventually have a systemic effect uh to where you know like inflammatory bowel disease um one of the most common situations with with inflammatory bowel disease will be like enteropathic arthritis. You'll have that arthritis spread, uh, the, that inflammation spreading to the rest of your body, affecting now all of your joints to make you feel like you have arthritis when 
you don't, you have inflammatory bowel disease. And when this, when this is managed, the enteropathic arthritis goes away. <laughs> uh, and so obviously what I'm talking about is when you have uh, uh, the amount of inflammation um, uh, or, or identifying that your, your gut, your intestine is the primary source of inflammation um, uh, and you give it the tools that it needs to be able to, um, uh, what the, oh, sorry, yeah, what the sweet fern does is um, uh, it gives your body the ability to, to create glutamine, the barrier, the mucin barrier, uh, in the presence of cortisol. So you can be stressed and you'll always be making that barrier. So it solves, you know, one of the problems. Obviously, we need to learn how to manage our stress <laughs> and we need to maybe uh, eat more fiber or um, uh, maintain some ketogenesis, the production of ketone bodies. So they have something to eat other than your mucin. Uh, and so the, um, um, so yeah, uh, sweet fern is super simple in, in this mechanism to just say, Hey, no matter how stressed out you are, always make that glutamine, make that barrier s seals up your intestines. Uh, so, and, and then as well, having some action on the, the, in, the, the, the endothelial junctions and it's a little bit more complex than that, but for the sake of, for the, for the scope of this presentation, it seals up your intestines so that there's the primary source of inflammation is gone. And in our anecdote, in our story, in the experience that we have is when you, uh, uh, when is that out of all of the medicine, this has been the most powerful and most effective at controlling and managing mental health, giving you the ability to be happy and healthy and motivated and know that everything in the world is going to be okay. Most people get the benefit from this plant more than anything else. Um, and so the anxiety and depression being very uh, um, uh, manageable uh, um, when somebody is enjoying this tea. And it is it, like this one too, like those are probably two of the most delicious tasting teas that you could have the the we can the the sweet flag and the sweet fern are like it's like cinnamon it's like a complex cinnamon thing i don't know how to say it um, it's really really good and you could drink it every day for the rest of your life it, like for for safety but also just because you want to because it's so delicious and so yeah i just wanted to be able to um uh, I, ho I hope that that makes sense. Uh, so I wanted, you know, two two solid tools to 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 using medicine in a, in mental health uh, management, uh, something that works directly with the mental health issues, um, and then something that has more of a peripheral action, but like a very effective way to be able to uh, give us the ability to control some really nasty. Uh, um, issues. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, I guess, um, uh, I, yeah, so I hope, I hope that makes sense. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I, that I have enough time at the end to be able to talk, to be able to have a little bit of a discussion, to be able to answer some questions. Because I feel like I talk real fast. I just also why my mouth was so dry. Uh, I just like slammed a whole bunch of coffee on accident. I didn't even mean to. Um, but yeah, I had real lots of coffee. And then I was like, oh. So I probably talk real fast. So I wanted to be able to, yeah, facilitate a little bit of a discussion if anybody had any questions. That's great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Migwich, thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge today and uh, on such a very important topic uh, as well. Uh, anxiety and depression certainly affecting a lot of the population and perhaps even more so now within the pandemic. And I do uh, see that we, we have had a few uh, questions come up in the chat, so maybe we could start uh, the discussion there. Um, I believe uh, the first question I'm seeing is uh, from Julie. Uh, can sweet fern be eaten in a salad instead of through tea? 
Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Sweet. I didn't see that question. Um, eaten in a salad. No, no, it's got to get in order to, in order to extract the beta carophyllene, the, the, the nutrient that's responsible for the action that I mentioned, it has to get to like almost 70 degrees, uh, and like 73 or 75. I can't exactly remember, but it has to get to like hotter than what your body is capable of. And this is, uh, because it's, it's in a fibrous case that, uh, your digestive system is not able to open. So it needs hot water. And so tea. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's not to say it probably wouldn't taste good in a salad, but yeah, I mean, like it's, 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 it's the best as a tea and, um, uh but yeah it's because it has to get to that temperature to extract the the actual you know the medicine that you need out of it oh, great thanks joe uh actually there was an earlier question as well from uh catherine uh and she was asking are there protocols that one should follow when gathering sweet flag and sweet fern oh okay yeah so that's uh that's fun too that's a really good question um obviously um being able to cover all of the every detail in a, in uh such a small amount of time it be, it's pretty hard but um this is definitely something that we teach about um probably spending the most dedicating the most amount of time to teaching about is um sustainability um and so with the week uh, with the sweet flag um the lemongrass one uh this um f these these flowers um they're pretty nice pretty beautiful little flowers in the summer uh but these will turn into seeds and one plant will have like 400 seeds six 800 seeds on it at one time and a really tremendous amount of seeds and um the plant, it's an aquatic plant, semi-aquatic plant. So it, it grows like with cattails usually. Uh, you can see it probably from this picture even, it looks just like cattails. Um, but um, uh, the plant is like, it's what it wants is to, is for the water to recede. The, the, it's in its favorite environment to grow in. It wants that water to recede uh, in the fall. Uh, like be, So like an ephemeral, swamp um so the water goes away in the fall and then the plant will fall over then the seeds spread but it doesn't always get to grow in its favorite environment so it stays erect because the water doesn't doesn't go down the water level doesn't fluctuate so it just stays erect all of the seeds will then be eaten mainly by indigo bunting indigo buntings they're a type of winter sparrow and um they love these seeds eat them all all of those seeds are digested and destroyed and this plant never gets to spread so when you're picking it we try to pick it at an appropriate time when you could harvest the seeds and spread them around um so that you could you could help it out that's the most important thing um uh not to say uh not to say that um uh harvesting protocols is usually uh uh it's different everywhere generally there's a there's a, like there's a, there's a uh protocol to be able to say thank you to be able to give thanks for this plant in the form of tobacco or feeding frogs or candies or hair or where it's different everywhere that you go in my community it's uh it's it's mainly tobacco that's used to say thank you um uh, but yeah for protocol we we ensure that you're helping the plant that's the most important thing um for the sweet fern um the sweet fern the more you pick the more that grows <laughs> it's like mint uh it's like how do you sustainably harvest mint <laughs> so that there's more to grow well the worse you treat it the more that's going to grow <laughs> that's what it, like if you ever plant mint in a garden oh man that's a that's a mistake you could never get rid of it sweet fern is sort of the same way so just the act of harvesting it is helping oh, that's great thank you joe there, there's quite a few more questions here so i'll uh, just start reading them off uh i know Joe, you said you like your, your teas really strong, but Nola was asking, is there a recommended amount to take or frequency to use the sweet fern for health benefits? 
Um, to that, um, my answer is always um, enjoy it. And you're, if you're enjoying it, you're doing it right. <laughs> and so that goes to from like uh, the strength, how, like how strong do I make it? Well, this is so subjective. I like it super strong. My wife likes it super weak. Uh, and, and, and like, I, I have to make it so that everyone enjoys it. And so, uh, um, so if it's so, if it's too strong, then use less when you make it the next time, if it's too weak, use more, uh, you figure out how you like, it. it's like Goldilocks sort of situation. You just got to figure out what tastes good. Uh, and then you enjoy it. So like, um, it's kind of like coffee, you know, like you, you have coffee in the morning and it's an enjoyable activity you're like this is this is great um if you have 18 cups of coffee in a day you you know that that's there's a problem there <laughs> and you know you're not doing something good that being said though i think that um uh, when you're when you're trying to understand how much to take there's there's really um no upper tolerable intake of a tea that you're making that's an enjoyable strength so when you go to when 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 like you would probably die of electrolyte imbalance because of drinking too much fluid before something ha before you would be getting belly aches or before you'd have you know, some liver enzymes start showing up on your uh, on on your blood work to be off you know uh, and so you kind of have to just enjoy it. Uh, you know, a couple of cups throughout the day is is perfectly acceptable for the rest of your life, um, and, and certainly has and is being done in Indigenous communities anyway, all over Ontario already. Um, and so, like to achieve that upper to tolerable intake would be uh, would be would be an accomplishment, and probably really hard to actually achieve. So, but that's a good question and a good thing to be cognizant of. Um, and that goes for both of them too. If you're enjoying it, it's going to be hard to, 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 to do, to go wrong. Like when you get bananas, you eat, you, you get a bundle of bananas. You don't sit down and eat the whole bundle of bananas. <laughs> there's, there's constraint there. You say, I'm going to have one today, maybe Joe. two. Thank you, Joe. Uh, another question uh, from Emma. Where are sweet flag and sweet fern available to harvest? Um, available to harvest all over Ontario, in every little nook and cranny, from southwestern Ontario to the Laurentian lowlands around Ottawa to the far north, right in the boreal. This, these are really, really common. Um, some places you might have to search a little bit more. I had a woman find it in downtown Hamilton at a at a dog park her she was from moose factory in the far north and her son was diagnosed with crohn's disease and she found it in a park at a dog park in hamilton ontario at night she sent she was sending me pictures of plants at night and then she found it so you could kind of you could find you could find it anywhere great thanks joe uh yolanda um she was asking, can you tell me if you can store the plants through the winter? Uh, if so, how? Yeah, so everything, we harvest it and then you dry it. Yeah, because winter, you can't pick plants all, winter, all year, <laughs> like in other parts of the world. So you just dry it, put it in a jar, and uh, you're good to go. Just enjoy it. Uh, that's what everything is behind me. Our, our uh, tea cupboard. Uh, as Yolanda was also asking, and can you post the Anishinaabe work for sweet flag fern? I, she might have meant word. Uh, we can would be sweet flag. Uh, it's always hard doing this because uh, <laughs> uh, sweet flag and sweet fern it's, it sometimes can be confusing. Uh, but we can for sweet flag and mish for sweet fern. Great, thank you. And uh, I know we're just at about one, so we have one other question from Noah. Are there any dangerous lookalike plants to be aware of for sweet fern? 
for for sweet fern no there's there's nothing there's there's nothing that looks like it other than like ferns and uh it's it's not a fern either it's a shrub it just the shrub looks the leaves from this shrub look like a fern so they called it sweet fern but it's a shrub and uh um it's uh, it's very distinguishable. I mean, the only mistake that you could make is by harvesting like from an actual fern, uh, and then and then uh, you know then the, then there might be issues. But like a fern leaf, it's not gonna smell or taste like anything, and you're you're not gonna like it. This smells and tastes like the most amazing, complex, full-bodied cinnamon, magnificent tea that you could drink all day long every single that's what's important to remember if you're enjoying it you're doing it right so some good questions yeah very good questions and i i see we are at one o'clock i thank you make rich so much Jim. it's uh it was a great presentation and uh really enjoyed it uh, just to remind everyone uh, this has been recorded i know some of you uh, said that you had some issues with the audio and video at different points so we will uh get this posted to our rehabilitation sciences and our noted websites within the next couple of weeks and uh we actually had a couple of questions from yolanda and uh, yolanda Wanakamek is our new director of Indigenous Affairs at NOSM, and uh, she's actually going to be delivering our next webinar in March, uh, March 24th at noon. And uh, the topic is community engagement, uh, wise practices. And uh, the RSVP information for that webinar will be coming out uh, uh, in the next week. But uh, thank you again, uh, Joe uh, Nikwich, and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Sweet, yeah. Thanks for that opportunity there, Mike. We'll see you guys later. Yes, thanks, Joe.